So welcome, welcome. This is the STEAM Sport Robotics and STEM Workshop sponsored by Black and Robotics. I am Carlotta Berry, and I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering um, in the Lawrence J. Giacolotto Endowed Chair of ECE at Rosewood Institute of Technology. This is in Terre Haute, Indiana. A lot of people have never heard of it, but it's about an hour west of Indianapolis, right in between Indianapolis and St. Louis. So we're gonna do several things today and we're gonna wrap up with me giving you the details that you need in order to build an Arduino robot. But there are a few other concepts that I wanted to go over first. So I thought we could do um, introductions. I don't know what this extra period is here. It's Black and Robotics, as well as Black and Engineering. I'm co-founder of both. We're started during summer 2020 which we like to call the summer of social justice after the killing of George Floyd. And on social media, it brought together black researchers, professionals, academics, and students in, in, in robotics in particular, in engineering and in STEM to amplify collective voices for racial justice, but also to advocate for more diversity, inclusion, and equity in these organizations and ensure that we have a seat at the table during development, test, and deployment of robotic systems for collective social justice, because robotics ties the lines of machine learning, artificial intelligence. And right now, you know, we're seeing a lot of bias in these areas, including people using robotics for policing, using um, image um, recognition in order to match to people's driver's license and arrest them for crimes they did not commit. So Black and Robotics is about more than just the technology of robotics, but how our technology is used to make sure that it does not harm in particular our people. Remember, if you have any questions while I'm speaking, please put it in the chat and I keep losing my chat in the window. Okay, there we go. So today our objectives are to introduce you to three technologies that you all can use with your kids to help to not only get them ready for their FLL season, but also to help them with programming, to help them with electronics, and to help them to understand Arduino. So my primary focus is to get your kit going with the Arduino Uno, but I need to build the structure up so that you can help the kiddos of all levels. Cause I assume that steam sport is for everything from kindergarten to high school, right? So yeah, so I'm gonna show you some things that you can use with all your kids so that when they get to the point that they're on the FLL team, they're ready. And I will tell you, I have been an FLL <clears throat> and a VEX um, robotics mentor. And uh, my daughter is currently still on her VEX robotics team. And I have been a judge and a judge advisor for first robotics competition, which is the high school level competition where they build a robot in six weeks, okay? So that's what we're gonna do today, VEX VR. We're gonna do that for a little while to talk about some things you can do with your elementary kids. Then we're gonna go to Tinkercad which is something that you can use with your elementary to high school kids at different levels because you can use it in Scratch or Arduino. And then I show how I use that to introduce those same concepts on the kit that you guys have. And then I'm gonna to end today by talking about what you can do with that kit to get an Arduino robot working, okay? So, so William, because you know I'm designing this around your request, if at any point you feel like I'm focusing on something that's not of interest to you, Feel free to let me know. Okay. So um, the things we're going to try to do is about 20 minutes <clears throat> on the VEX, because that doesn't take very long. Then about 40 minutes on the Tinkercad, where we focus a little bit on doing that in Scratch or Blockly, which is the graphical programming for the smaller kids. Then I show you how to do Arduino inside of Tinkercad for the older kids. And then after that, we go to the actual physical system that you guys got, the kit you got in the mail, and how to do the Arduino on that. And then we end up with the robotic stuff. So William, this is your job, because I said William was going to have a job. You are the official timekeeper. So make sure that the 20 minute mark, because I'm not used to doing this so quickly, and I don't want to go over. So at the 20 minute mark, I want to switch from VEX to Tinkercad, right? And then at the one hour mark, at the halfway point, I want to switch over to your actual Elegoo kit. Does that make sense? Are you saying 20 minutes from when we start or 20 minutes? I'm uh, saying 20 minutes from now. Oh, Lord, it's already quarter after. <clears throat> I have to modify this. Okay. Um, how about we do 15 minutes? 
So at 1030, we're going to switch from VEX VR. <clears throat> okay. And then at 11 o'clock, we'll switch over to the kit. Okay. Because gotcha. we won't need a lot of time with VEX VR. Okay. Are there any questions so far? How are we doing? Okay. So um, I always like to tell people my journey to STEM um, was not a pipeline. It was absolutely an obstacle course, which means that because it was not a crystal stair for me, it may not be a crystal stair for you today. And I don't believe in, I wasn't good at math. I don't like engineering. I don't like science. I think <laughs> anyone can learn to do this if they want to do this, right? I wanted to be a high school math teacher. Didn't even know what engineering was and then selected the major because somebody in high school told me um, I was good at math and science, but that's really not enough, especially if you're a black person in STEM, because you have to be able to um, aware of the obstacles and how to navigate them. So finding your community and support is so important. That's why we do these workshops for kids and adults, because we want to make STEM universal so that everyone knows that they can achieve something, right? Even if it's just to make an LED or light blink today, which I hope to at least get that done before we finish. So I always like to show the video, which is the motivation for how we started. And that's my inspiration from back in 2021. Um, to so my this daughter. Juneteenth, I am bringing my STEM to the streets. I'm taking my robotics and engineering out of the classroom and onto all platforms in order to diversify STEM by connecting with all people in order to show the humble beginnings that Black people have come from to be Black and excellent. Happy Juneteenth. And then ways I've done this on social media are sharing these STEM videos. And this is the actual robot that you would build or something similar. So that's the other reason I want you to see this video. So this, we, we just have to get the motors added to it, but everything else should already be in the kit that you have. And so, what, so this oh, sorry, got to get the video. So, so the thing you should have seen in that video is, William, the two things that we have to get you are those, those yellow motors, which you can get on Amazon, and you can actually buy them with the wheels where they come together. And then at that point, you would stick those, let's say, on the bottom of a cardboard box or a shoe box, and then you would just attach the microcontroller to the top with the breadboard and just stick the wires in. Gotcha. Does that make sense what I'm saying? You already have the sonar, which is the only other thing I used in that video because the sonar is in the kit you have now. The okay. microcontroller is in the kit you have now. And we just have to do the wiring to the, to the um, device. Okay. You know what? Um, does it look like this, by the way? The, the... So this is the one I thought he ordered you, but I had somebody else yeah. order it for you. Is that the... No, that's not no. the one we have. That's not the one you guys have. Hold your kid up for me. How was this the... <laughs> superstar. So you actually have more stuff in yours than I have in mine. Okay, because yours is the superstar kit. The most complete starter kit has less stuff. So mine has less stuff than yours. The reason I'm asking is, is there a... Do you, you guys know what a breadboard is? Yes. Is there a breadboard in there? Yes. Okay, good. So... Okay, so the one I have does not have a breadboard. So the good news is that breadboard and that microcontroller would then be put on top of the cardboard box. You wire into it and then you jump the wires down to the motors. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a little bit of that today. I just was curious. So yeah, I had somebody else order it for you and I thought I get, told him to order the one I had, but he actually ordered you the better one, so that's good. Okay, because mine doesn't have a breadboard in it. So first, what is a robot? Um, I know you guys have been doing FLL, so I'm gonna make this very high level, but when I teach other people, what I tell them is that there's six things that we have to think about when we um, design a robot. First is autonomous. 
That means it has to have some level of intelligence, a remote control robot, which you can drive with a game controller or a television remote, um, has no autonomy. It has no intelligence. It only does what you tell it to do when you drive it. In FLL, you use robots that are fully autonomous, which means you have to design it to do some kind of game challenge from beginning to end. A robot has to have some kind of body. Typically, the body needs to be based upon what the robot has to do. So like FLL has a, a game challenge every year. So you have to use those Lego pieces to build the um, body to meet the game challenge. Many times you wanna have a sensor. If you want your robot to have some level of intelligence, it needs to have sensors on it to make decisions. Distance sensors, color sensor, sound sensor, light sensor, temperature sensor. You pick the sensors that are most appropriate for what the robot has to do. If you want your robot to follow a line, then you put an infrared sensor pointing at the ground where it detects black and white to move over the line. A robot also needs a task. It's not very interesting if the robot does not have something to do. Whether you give it the task or your task is to complete some kind of game mission. And it has to have a way of acting on the world and having a goal. The robot acts on the world with its wheels. So we call the wheels the effectors and the actuator would be the motor. So the motors and the wheels are the actuators and the effector. But you could also have a robot that flies. You could have a drone. It may have actuators that are motors, but the effectors are the propellers. Um, you could have a robot with flippers, an underwater robot. Um, but you pick the type of robot you need for what you want your robot to do. And then you give it its goal. Um, a lot of times in my class, which I'm teaching right now, their first goal is, can you get the robot moving? Second goal is, can you make the robot move and avoid obstacles? Can you make the robot follow a wall? And we build on the layers of the robot by having it do things like that. Are there any questions? I know it's early, we're all a little sleepy, <laughs> aren't we? Okay, so the robot is made up, the brain, the body, the effectors, the actuators, and the sensors. One of the main things we're gonna focus on today is the brain, which is the microcontroller, which is the Arduino Uno in your kit. Because if I can program the brain of the robot, I can take it from being a remote control robot to a fully autonomous robot. That robot you saw with my daughter at the beginning, we call that a fully autonomous ob obstacle avoidance robot. All it does is avoid obstacles, but if it can do that without human intervention, it's a fully autonomous obstacle avoidance robot, right? So it may not do anything else, but at least it can do that well. In FLL, you guys design your robot to be able to complete certain missions autonomously, even if the robot drives back to home base and you have to push a button for it to do something else. So here's an example of uh, the VEX robotics team that my daughter is on. And their challenge is they actually do both. So they remote, they can do remote control in a team of two to drive the robot. So this is my daughter and one of her buddies over here. And then they can also do coding challenges to do these exact same tasks that have to happen autonomous to get extra points. So I'm gonna show you this because then we're gonna go to the VEX VR website where I show how the kids learn how to do some of the programs. Uh, let me ask you a question, Dr. Bear. Do yes. you prefer VEX or uh, FTC? I'm going to tell you why we changed over. And I hate to do this because I've been yelled at for first mentors for doing it. VEX is cheaper. And th that, that just comes down to it. It, it was all about money. Um, we're, we're sponsored by the Girl Scouts. And we don't have many, a lot of other sponsors. So the parents were putting in money to supplement the team. Mm -hmm. And just the amount of plays the girls could get for, for less money, we that's why we changed. We were FLL for about three years, and now we've been VEX for about three years. The learning opportunities are the same. The kids yeah. get the same amount of um, engagement. All of that is exactly the same. 
But like um, the kit of parts and the annual uh, registration is like $200. Um, and that comes with them shipping you whatever additional stuff you need. Then the competitions we go to are about $30 each, right? $30 to $50 yes. on vets, um, right? Oh. Right. And when we did FLL, the registration was a lot higher. And even going to the competitions was higher. We, did, we never did FTC, I'll be honest. We did FLL. The girls are actually, they started in about third grade. They're in the eighth grade now. So after this year, um, we're transitioning them over to high school and we're shutting the team down or we're giving it back to Girl Scouts because the high schools have FRC and FTC already. So the girls could then join the robotics team at the high school if they want. But that was why we changed. It was, it was, a, it was a cost thing for us. It wasn't that, like I said, I, I've been a, a judge for first, but... It was just like financially we couldn't do it. And there was there's another parent on the team who was a first mentor. And he also pushed us to change over to VEX because he was like, I think the girls can get more competition. We, were, we went from doing maybe one or two a year to three because we had more money to be able to register them to go. And there also were more. So one thing um, about three or four years ago, the mayor of Indianapolis put a lot of money into trying to put a robotics team in every elementary school in the city. And it was for VEX. So they were sponsoring it. So now a lot of the schools have VEX as well. So because of that, there's VEX competitions everywhere around here. So it's really easy to get in one for $30, whereas first was not quite as accessible either. Gotcha. Okay. That's, that's some of the decisions that we're, we're making on the FTC level. That's one of the things I can't get my arms around trying to yeah, and, 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 and VEX has levels. So they have elementary level, they have a middle school level. Like this year, our girls will compete for the first time at the middle school level. Before this year, we had younger kids on the team. So they had to compete at the youngest age of the youngest child on the team. But now during the pandemic, some of those kids left. So only the older girls are left. They're all eighth graders. So we're actually going to compete at the middle school level for the first time this year. So one, one more question. Search and rescue. Yeah. Have you... Any experience, any, any thoughts? So um, search and rescue, I have read some things on it. And for my dissertation, I talked about that a little. Um, it depends. Is this what the challenge is for the year? Um, you know what? I, I've just read on it and thought, you know, maybe. So, so, maybe. Yeah. so um, I've had some students also mm -hmm. do some research projects on this. So, so search and rescue, we obviously simulated, but Dr. Robin R. Murphy is the expert on that area. So you should research some of her work on um, search and rescue, which I believe they also call urban robotics, but mm -hmm. basically um, looking at using robots to help in natural disasters. Her mm -hmm. robots and her grad students actually went to the World Trade Center um, and used robots to go through the rubble. And I believe some of the robots actually also ended up at that uh, condo that fell in Florida about three or four months ago. Yeah. And what happens is when it becomes unsafe structurally for first responders and firefighters to go into these types of structures, they will send in a robot. And what the research shows is that the robot can go in and move the rubble around, but they still have to have an interface virtually with a um, firefighter looking at it because the robot in the image recognition may not always recognize that was a bone or that was a foot or that was a person, although the robot can go in more safely. So search and rescue is looking at ways to keep human beings safe while they go to rescue other people, but using the um, technology of the robot. So that's what my dissertation was on is human robot interaction, looking at interfaces so a person can remotely control a robot and through that interface, understand what's going on, like where the robot is in the world, what the robot sees, how do you make decisions about what to do next, that kind of thing. Gotcha. So that's the big part of search and rescue. But once again, sensors are the key to that. Like heat sensors to determine if, you know, sensing body heat, maybe color sensors to determine if I'm seeing flesh color or something else. Is that a piece of rubble? Is that a rock or is that a bone? Artificial intelligence, being able to look at these things and make those kind of decisions. Gotcha. All right. I can tell I'm not going to get through the slides because y'all got some good questions, but no, let's keep going. So, but this, so the good thing about the VEX competition as well is they provide a lot of online learning tools. One of them is called VEX VR, which is completely free. And you can learn how to do block-based or graphical-based coding, which is the same thing the girls use on the robot on the website. And it has levels so that you can use it for everything from elementary school students to up. So I wanted you guys to do an activity with that today because then you can see how to use this. 
So if you go to education.vex.com, they actually have a portal of learning activities that you can do with kids. And we're gonna try one of them today so that you can see how you could do some programming with kids. Um, the ones we're gonna do are all games. So, you know, it's a game because you know kids like to play games, but they're driving a virtual robot in the world using Scratch. And you could do one where you're looking for a hidden message. You could have the robot drive through numbers, like all the even numbers or all the odd numbers. You could have one where you program your robot to draw and make a spiral, et cetera. So they're learning to code as they complete these challenges. So the one I wanted us to try is to cross out every number. But before we do that, I wanna show you one that I always do with my kids um, when I do workshops with them because they absolutely love it. It's called Castle Crasher and they design a robot to knock over castles. So um, what we're gonna do is do Castle Crasher and then we're gonna do cross out every number. I'll show you where you can get other activities later and then we're gonna move on to the next topic, okay? So um, for what we're gonna do is like I said here, you do this level one, just make the kids drive through all the numbers. So they're learning how to go forward, how to turn, et cetera. And their hint is each one of these squares is 200 millimeters by 200 millimeters so they can figure out how long it has to go forward before it has to turn. The next level up is you could tell them something like you have to cross them out in numerical order. And there's a pin you can use on the robot to mark as you go. Or for higher level kids, tell them that they have to mark the odds red and the evens blue, or they have to do it in order. Okay, so I want, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna do this with you guys so you can try this as well. So what we're gonna do is I'm now gonna go to the internet. So I'm gonna stop sharing the slides and I'm, we're gonna go to the web and I'm gonna have each of you type in on the web. So this is what it's gonna look like when we're in there. So like I said, you can look at a robot view or you can look at the high level view and this is the code we're gonna use. Have you guys done Scratch before with your kids? Yes. Okay. Yep, so, um, um, so we're gonna go to vr.vex.com. So I'm gonna start, stop sharing this and share my other screen. Um, vr.vex.com, I'm gonna put it in the chat. Ooh, it's 10.30, well, William, we gonna do it this at least once. Thank you for that, but I know I'm off schedule, but we gotta do the activities, doggone it. It ain't right if we don't do the stuff we supposed to do. Um, I'll get us back on schedule. I'll make it happen, Chief. I want you to keep being timekeeper though. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let me know when you guys all have vr.vex.com opened up. Okay. Hey, we're up. Okay, mine okay. may not, I don't know if yours comes up at the same spot as mine because I've gone in here a lot. Yes. Okay, um, so what we want to do is we want to do one of the activities. So let me find, oh, I gotta go back to the slides. I can remember how, you, how I got there before, hold on. So inside the slides, we're going to go to playground on the upper right-hand side, playground. So we're gonna to go to playground and it's opening up. Can you guys still see my screen? Yes. Oh, okay. We're gonna to go to playground and then at the top, if you hit that middle menu, it gives you a lot of different activities you can do with the kids. So the one I do with the kids that they really like is called Castle Crasher. The young kids really like this one. So you do Castle Crasher, if you click on that, uh-oh, sorry. I'm trying to get this other window to go away. You guys just stay where you are. I was trying to get this pop-up window to go away. Okay. There we go. I need to get rid of this first. So maybe I'll put this up in the corner because you can show the robot moving as they're um, doing Castle Crasher. So I was trying to get that to be out of the way for you. So if we go to Castle Crasher, The goal is for the kids to knock over objects, right? So the robot starts down here in the middle. So you would then just put in some code to make the robot start. So I normally tell them just slide drive forward on there. 
that's good enough for what you're doing. And then if you push the play button, what happens? And so you see that the robot goes straight down the middle and knocks over two of the castles. But the robot's gonna drive forever because all I said was drive forward. So that's not good, right? So what you wanna do instead is drive forward for a certain amount of times. Then I say, just put the next one under there. Which is drive forward for 200 millimeters, okay? Then you hit the re replay button to start over. And then you hit play again and drive forward. And notice the robot only moves a little bit. It moved and it didn't even get to the castles, right? So instead of 200 millimeters, I would change 200 to maybe a thousand millimeters, okay? And then we start over and we try again. And after I show them how to do it, it drives forward a little bit, but it doesn't drive off. Then I would add a turn button. And then at this point, I would stop and tell the kids to play with the drive forward and turns until you're able to knock all the castles over. Okay, so that's teaching them about algorithmic programming, cause and effect, how much I need to move forward, how much I need to turn in order to knock over all the castles. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show you about that one. Any questions? It, this is good. We we purchased uh, Coder Z. Yeah. Um, at some point, well, they introduced it as a free thing during the pandemic. Yeah. We actually purchased it, but this is a free. It is. Resource. It is, and and you can change the views. Um, so you can show. So here's the here's the towers from another perspective, and this is free, Chief. Yeah. So so you know this is if you show the robot driving from this perspective, um, they can see it from the robot's point of view. They can see it from a top level view. So all these are different ways of looking at the castles. And now they're knocking them over from there, right? So if the kids, you can show them all the different ways they can look at it, um, which view you can take that away because they don't really care so much about that. And this is the one it came in on, okay? So then the other one on here is, and I'll just tell you a little bit, William, since you were talking about that, is the reason I, the way I discovered this is somebody from VEX reached out to Black and Robotics when they found out we were doing workshops for kids and one of their representatives showed us this because they wanted us to share this with people because it's free, wow. right? It's a free curriculum online. So that's how we, um, we discovered this. So um, now here's the one with the numbers. So once again, you're gonna drive and turn, but there is a way down here and I gotta remember where it is where you can drop a pin so you can keep up as the robot is moving with, um, what it has marked off. And of course, because I haven't done this in a while, I'm not gonna be able to find it. But yeah, so somewhere in here, there's a pin that you can drop. So the robot draws. And also you can do this in an activity. Oh, here it is. Set the robot to a pin color. Um, and then you want to move the robot pin down, right? Um, but I wanna do that before I move the robot. So I'm gonna put this above that. So this is something else you could do with the kids where you could have them draw their name, draw their initials, because there's a there's a blank one in here somewhere where if you drop the pen, you can see the kids say, I want you to draw the letter C if your first name starts with C. So I now have this in here. I think one of them came off and I drive forward. And now you can see what numbers the kids are marking off. So the first thing you could tell them is don't go in order, just drive and see, can you mark out all the numbers from one to 100? Okay, so has everyone been able to try some of this before we move on? Um, yes. And notice this one also has perspectives as well. So they can look at this from all the mm -hmm. different perspectives as they're driving it around, right? 